242 in the garden. <coughs> The rest of the world would hear that. begun. So go with joy where the crucified and risen Christ is sending you. And as you go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you now and forevermore. Amen. You may be seated. Children's time. Is that right? Susie said she messed them all up for me, and I'm like, if you did that, then I'm going to be all messed up. 
said, do not change me. Do not change me. <laughs> As I said, the layout out, I said, don't mess it up. Just go with what's written. So today is Holy Humor Sunday. I will announce that and let you know that this is the day that most Christian churches, denominations will mess things up in worship. They'll have jokes. Um, my friend Kate, who's over in Wisconsin Rapids now, who I'm actually going to go see when I'm on vacation, um, she pulled out the kazoos, and they all have to play kazoos during the first hymn. I, I didn't think we were quite ready for that. She also told them to wear funny socks and funny shirts and be ready to just have fun. The reasoning behind it is because Jesus had the last laugh over Satan and death, and so that's why we pull it together for Holy Humor Sunday. I'm not quite that creative, besides flipping the worship all the way backwards and around, so you're gonna be on your toes today. And, um, and the other reason is believing in Jesus, seeing is believing. Part of our scripture lesson today comes from the Gospel of John, and it's talking about Thomas. And you heard my story a little bit last Sunday about why I believe in the resurrection, and yet, there are people in our life, in our midst, who haven't ever seen the Lord and haven't ever seen Jesus. And so, Jesus blesses those people as well because just because you don't see him doesn't mean that he's alive. And Thomas was one of them. You know, his name is Doubting Thomas in Scripture, or at least that's what we call him. And he didn't believe because he wanted to see him. He wanted to put his hands and fingers in the nail holes and in the side. And when Jesus appeared to the disciples the first time, Thomas wasn't there. And then um, the second time, Thomas was finally there a week later. So Jesus would have appeared to them on the resurrection on our Easter Sunday that we celebrate. And then today, all of them were to gather again and Jesus appeared. And finally, Jesus said, peace be with you. And Thomas was there, and Jesus said, put your hand, or put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out and put it in my side and stop doubting a belief. And Thomas fell to his knees and said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, well, just because you have seen me, you have believed but blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. And so even though some of us have not ever seen Jesus with our own eyes, the question is, are we the ones also blessed because we believe and not have seen? And so this morning at Osage Church, um, I had Bruce Weiss, Weiss give his personal testimony of his story of what had happened to him. So if you get the YouTube link this afternoon from me, I encourage you to go and listen to that. But today you get to hear my sermon that I actually did give um, because I kind of went off script. But just know that we are blessed and he is here. And so we come, and we become who we are called to be, not through getting, not through acquiring, and not by possessing, but we become in our giving. And to that end, let us worship God by giving our good gifts. And so will the ushers please come forward and collect our morning offerings.
good and gracious God, help us to say thank you, to live with gratitude, to look for the best in each other, and to live charitably with all. May your resurrection never stop surprising us, disrupting us, and transforming us until Christ's kingdom comes. Amen. And you can either remain standing or you may be seated as I read the scripture lesson today from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house were where the disciples had met, were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came, so the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. <laughs> And yet, 
another question comes, do we really share our experience with others who asks us why we believe? Now I'm asking these questions because when someone asks you if you are a Christian, how do you, ex how do you respond? I tell them they, we wasted a lot of Sundays if it's not true. We wasted a lot of Sundays if it's not true. That's very good. I like that. How else? If somebody asks you if you are a Christian, how do you respond? Because I've seen Jesus in my friends and family. I've seen Jesus in my friends and family. And what they've done. And what they've done. For me, especially. Another answer could be, well, yeah, I am. I attend church every weekend and I'm involved with this or that. Or... I'm a Christian, and let me tell you about the risen Savior. In this day and age, it's difficult to answer that question. Because there are several Christians out there that think attending worship makes them a Christian. Though honestly, it doesn't make us any more of a Christian than saying we're a chef just because we can cook. When we're asked why we attend worship every week, have you thought about ways to answer them? Now, my answer could be, well, I'm a pastor and I have to be there. <laughs> but my answer is very simple. It draws me closer to God. And then the other questions are going to come, well, who is God and who is this? And, and that's for them to ask. And there are probably a lot of other reasons why we attend and why we must attend. And I was out on the internet, I know, don't always believe Google, but I came across Harvest Church's website of Sri Lanka. They give eight reasons why they attend church or why it is fulfilling to attend church. And the first one is, it is a way of showing our love for God. Number two, they say it builds up, builds us up spiritually. I've also heard in conversation, if I miss Sundays, my whole week is messed up. Number three, the Lord comes in the midst of people who gather to worship, even though Jesus lives in the heart of every believer, that whenever two or more people are gathered specifically for prayer, worship, or praise in his name, the Lord's presence is felt. Number four, they say it strengthens relationships with fellow Christians, which I believe is very true. And number five, it is a way of showing our obedience to God because continued absence can lead to willful sin. And number six, it provides accountability to spiritual leadership. Number seven, our prayers become stronger. And number eight, it is a way of honoring the Sabbath. Those are their eight reasons. And I think we can find ourselves in some of those eight reasons. And number seven, which says our prayers become stronger. Yesterday I got home from dropping Theo off at mom and dad's, and I got the mail and had one card in it. And the card was from Avon Rua. And in there, she tells me that she had a checkup everything is the same and she believes that our prayers and the community of God's prayers are at work and she thanks us for that so even though she's not here in worship she knows that we're praying for her she knows that um, she is healing and she is where she needs to be at this point with her illness and she appreciates that And then I think, just because we come to worship and we do all this, how did we get there? Because there is nowhere in the Bible that I can recall that we are commanded to read the Bible every day, 
nor are we commanded to attend church on Sundays because Christianity is not really a ritualistic religion. We're, we're raised to believe it, and we do because culture showed us through history that this is what we do. Attend worship, attend Sunday school, have Bible study, and to learn from each other. And those are straightforward answers, and still for some people, those answers are confusing because we don't always share the reasons why we attend worship, let alone why we believe in the risen Christ. We become robotic, and we're not always authentic. And so when I say I become closer to God, when somebody asks me why I attend, I also go to this response as far as the crucifixion and the resurrection because I think this helps them understand a little bit of why I believe without really seeing. I don't share my story like I did last week to everyone I meet, but it's because if I shared that with someone who's not ever worshipped in a Christian uh, church, they're going to think that it's all crazy talk. So I go with what scripture says. And the first is about the crucifixion where we have three crosses on a hill. The middle one is Jesus and we have two thieves on the other side of him. And the one thief is always criticizing Jesus and and mocking him and telling him, get down from that cross, you can save yourself. And the other thief is over here saying, shut up, we belong to be, we belong to be on these crosses because we have done wrong. And it continues through this whole day of Good Friday. And eventually this thief over here, whether it's on the right or left, I can't remember, but one of them turns to Jesus and says, will you remember me in paradise? And Jesus says, truly, I tell you, I, you will see me and you will be with me in paradise. To me, that is the reason of why I believe, because it's not just because we're going every Sunday and it's in our blood. But even for those who come to Jesus in the last moment, Jesus saves them. The thief on the other side, we can just guess where he went. And the other reason I believe without seeing really is because the women went to the tomb and they found it empty. And they were in shock and in awe. And they couldn't believe their eyes. And depending on which gospel account you read, they either went and told the disciples or they kept it to themselves. Because it was scary to see this open tomb with either an angel or the gardener or a man sitting in there. And Jesus gone. I mean, seriously, how would you react if you went to a loved one's grave right now, seen it dug up, and the casket completely empty? Number one, you wouldn't be able to leave your eyes because it wouldn't happen in today's world. Not that I know of. And we'd either run away in fear, or we'd be like, Questioning what happened. And the news wasn't common back then, nor is it common today for that to happen. And so when we look at Peter and John and the disciples and the women who ran and told or didn't tell, they didn't care who heard about it or was offended by what they had seen or shared because they were on fire with the Holy Spirit and realized that Jesus was alive. They had to be reminded a few times, but he was there. And we're constantly reminded to live like Christ in our everyday life. And it doesn't mean just an hour or two on a week. It's every waking minute. And I'm gonna tell you it's hard because I fail and the reason I fail is because I'm human. However, we must work at living and living it out better than what we are 
right now in five minutes. Because when we live out that Christ-like life, other people are going to see it. And they're going to know that we are true followers. And we're not just these lukewarm Christians who say, oh yeah, we go. You see, the Easter season, which is started last week with Easter, and it goes all the way till mid-May. It's about keeping that fire glowing and telling people how on fire we are about following Christ. And so when our actions don't line up with our speech, then we end up being like those false prophets that Jesus talks about in Scripture. You know, Peter and the other disciples, they lived this out. And that's why they were questioned. They were not supposed to share the message of the resurrection or speak in Christ's name at the time of his death, and yet they did. And the authorities hated it. So they crucified Jesus. They didn't want to hear about a resurrection because it didn't happen for them. And I don't think the disciples provoked the authorities no, I truly think that they were so filled with joy they couldn't help themselves because the Holy Spirit was sweeping them through Jerusalem with power to enable them to heal and to convert multitudes of people and they spoke boldly about their belief. And that's what we're called to do, to speak boldly. And then we have Thomas. Who doubted and I can't say that he was truly on fire until he actually saw Jesus and my guess is when he did he was truly excited and beaming with joy and just because we don't have that doesn't mean that we don't beam with joy we need to go and share openly and tell people what it means to be a Christian. Because if we don't, it's going to die. And so we have these two scriptures, the Old Testament and the New Testament, that identifies God, and the one in the Old Testament delivers Israel. And in the New Testament, that same God brings Jesus to life. And he commands us that we shall have no other gods before me. And if we hold on to that commandment and we worship and serve that Lord and God, we won't be led astray by those other prophets. And at the end of all of our gospel lessons, Jesus tells the disciples and commands the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. And while you make disciples, go and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And may it be so today. Amen. And so let us turn to that hymn of response, Thine is the Glory, number 251. Thank mm -hmm. you.
morning we keep a dear friend of mine's family in our prayers, the family of George Binky. He died last Wednesday and they are putting him to rest this afternoon. Um, we also keep Dick and Dora Biederman, if you know them, from the UCC Church. They are moving from faith-assisted living from their home, hopefully within the month. And then we'll also continue to keep Avon in our prayers. Are there other loved ones to be lifted up this morning? My, my pastor, when I was a boy growing up in Washington, Iowa, passed away. His name was Reverend Peterson. And uh, he was 92. And they've been married for over 70 years. Wow. And not only was he my pastor, he was also one of my best friends. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that name. Was he still in Washington? Nope, he, was, he, he retired as a pastor and became a, a nursing home administrator in Omaha. Oh, really? Yeah. Good for him. I'm going to retire. <laughs> <laughs> he was really good. It's over you. <laughs> well, thank you. So if you didn't hear Dean, Reverend Peterson uh, died. He was at his home pastor down in Washington. He was 92 years old, and uh, he was in Omaha as a nursing home administrator after he retired. And he was Dean's one of Dean's best friends. So we keep Dean and Reverend Peterson's family in our prayers. Any other loved ones to be lifted up this morning? Nina. Continue with Allison. She's trying to make some treatment decisions and um, we can they sent her information to Mayo for a second opinion. Okay. On what she needs to have done. Keep her in our prayers, absolutely. Anyone else? Then let us come to God in prayer. Holy gracious God, we do come to you today on this Sunday of death being conquered and realizing how important it is to be authentic in our answers. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for blessing us with your love and grace and your forgiveness and mercy. We come to you today knowing that there are many in our midst and even in our families who are struggling today with a physical illness, uh, either, even a mental illness, even just struggling, Lord, with life. We lift them to you, Lord, knowing that you're surrounding them with your love and care. And Lord, we pray for those who are who are just searching in this life for something to bring them joy sometimes they're not able to find it lord and we pray that somehow somewhere you place us in their life so that we can help them discover how joyful you are lord today we come and lift to you the family of george Binky the family of Reverend Peterson. And we pray, Lord, for peace to be with them and bring comfort and knowing that you've called them home. We pray, Lord, for Dick and Dora Biederman as they transition out of their home into faith-assisted living. We pray for their son, John, who is helping pack them up and make that move. Lord, we continue to lift to you Avon Ruup, who continues to battle her fight with cancer, and yet she is stable and doing well. And so, Lord, we ask for that continued healing spirit to be upon Allison as she puts forth that fight with her cancer diagnosis. We continue to pray for her doctors and nurses and the whole medical staff that is helping treat her and give her advice of treatment. Lord, we lift to you all of our family that is here today and not with us. And we pray, Lord, for continued safety and continued guidance of your word. Because, Lord, in these moments of concern, 
we know you're also in those moments of joy and life. The moments of birthdays and anniversaries and the moments of fellowship and conversation. Lord, we thank you and we come to you praying the prayer that your son Jesus Christ taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us stand to which would have been the call to worship this morning. So please join me in our responsive call to worship. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Into our fears and through our locked doors. Oh my God. When we think peace be with you means no change or disruption. Come, Lord Jesus. Amidst our lives that confuse religious entertainment with Easter fulfillment. Come, Holy Spirit. For the sake of a community meant to be its best during crisis. Come, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Welcome to Eden Presbyterian Church on this second Sunday of Easter. Uh, we're, uh, announcements today, I will tell you, I'm leaving on Tuesday to go to see Kate in Wisconsin Rapids. I'll be gone through next Tuesday. Um, Thursday, if you would like to go St. Anne, to St. Anne's for United Methodist Church, they do have breakfast from 7.15 to 9.15 every Thursday. And this week, they're serving pancakes. On Saturday, it did not get in the announcements, but we are having an all-church um, cleanup, work outside, work inside, um, I did put in the newsletter that if weather permitting, if it's raining or if it's too windy to burn things, you might want to call Kurt Randolph or even uh, Dan Sitting. He's here today um, to make sure it is actually still happening. I think they're going to start at 8 or 9. I don't remember the time, but come and help where you can. And next uh, Sunday, from four to six, if you would like to go to the Visitation Catholic Church for their drive through turkey casserole supper, it is a free will donation, and you can do that too. Uh, Diane Wilson will be here next week leading you in worship. Uh, she's the one that had all the sports balls that one Sunday, so. She forgot. Yep, I told her she forgot them, so we gotta make sure she gets them next Sunday. Any other announcements before I forget? Then let us turn to our opening hymn which is, I know that my Redeemer lives, number 239. 